G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and Australian sci-fi fandom. Uh, my name is Dags and did you know that my co-host is just so cool that at one time on a cruise ship, he got out of the shower wearing nothing but his Sunday best only to discover a crew member was copping an eyeful of our lad through the porthole window whilst cleaning the lifeboat which was parked outside. Yes, he's here and he's doing the full Jaffra. <laughs> hey, Dags. I mean, uh, that was one of those cases where uh, they well and truly got a, a glimpse of my anchor. <laughs> Oh, jeepers, creepers. There, yeah. That is an image that uh, I'm sure will stay with people forever. So he would look through the porthole and goes, holy guacamole, look, aliens are invading the earth. <laughs> oh, jeepers, creepers. Uh, guess what, fans? This is our final episode for the season. Now, it's very funny because when we started this uh, particular show, we said we're going to be doing 10 episodes. And as it turned out, we then said, oh, yeah, we'll do a spinal tap number 11. So this is episode number 11. But, of course, Jeffro has only been part of it for 10 episodes. So in the end, it kind of all balances out. What do you think? It's like crank it up to 11. Asterix conditions apply. Absolutely fantastic. Well, as always, we've got to get on with the show because there's so much for us to cover off. And the most important thing, or at least one of the most important things we have, is our letter of comment. So, of course, we've received a yet another exciting letter, which the Jeffro is about to read out. So, Jeffro, who did we get this letter from and what's it about? Yes, this letter comes from uh, Michael J. Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> so, uh, he... he... <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, go on. So, so uh, Mick writes, Dear nerds, what do you think science fiction fandom will be like in 10 years' time? Ooh, let's get in the TARDIS and find out. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I've actually had a few discussions with a, a number of people to say uh, how things have changed over the decades uh, and what the future uh, looks like. And I know you've got some... Um, sort of theories that you want to sort of cover off as someone who actually is an active part of fandom and actually goes to fan club events and has, you know, like with a finger on the pulse of everything that's going around. It is pretty clear to see that things have changed in the past decade uh, or two. So if you're a bit of a pessimist, you'd probably be thinking, well, it's a bit iffy. We're not entirely sure, but if you're an optimist and there are cases where optimism is actually called for because there are things going on around the place and you go, oh, actually, that's actually quite good to see that that's happening. It may all still be okay. But uh, what do you think, old son? I know you've got some thoughts and views as to what you think fandom will be like in 10 years' time. Well, it certainly has been interesting to see how over the last, you know, three decades, how the social aspect has, has certainly declined. And certainly in terms of meetings and such, like when I uh, remember going to meetings, we're all in our um, uh, 20s and, and sort of eventually the 30s and there'd be some new people come in. But you go to the meetings and you'll know this yourself. You won't sort of see too many people under the age of 40 at the meetings. Yeah, that's very, very true. And that's something I've noticed um, over the my journey in that uh, what used to happen is you'd have older people at, say, club fan club meetings. Younger people would come in and effectively drive the older people away, mainly because they were loud and enthusiastic and whatever else. And it would just be the continuing um, refresh cycle every you know, 10 years, five years, whatever. But that hasn't really happened, as you said, in the past couple of decades. And the older people have stayed around. And it is quite rare to find younger people, one, going to events and two, sticking with events. Because as I used to say, getting someone to attend a fan club social meeting was relatively easy. Getting them to the second one was the hard part. And of course, the downside to a lot of this situation is that younger people will go to an event, see all these, effectively all these old farts, and go, well, there's no young people for me to hang out with, and there's no incentive for them to stick around. So that's actually definitely one of the big issues that we've got. In fact, I think you went to uh, America a few years back and went to a, uh, a literary um, club, and you went to the special effort of getting there, and you realise that basically you were the youngest people in the room, and that was saying something. So I think those people attending those meetings now, once they get to a certain age, I mean, meetings will just have to die off. Yeah, it's interesting that I know you don't attend uh, social club 
gatherings. But as I said at the start, I do. And I have seen some things that have made me feel, well, maybe there's still some life in the old girl yet, so to speak. So there are four big fan clubs in Melbourne specifically, and all four of them are still chugging away quite well. So they're not like when they have social events like gatherings and whatever else, they're not pulling in gigantic numbers, but there is a core group of people who are still attending things on a regular basis. So the four clubs are the Melbourne Science Fiction Club. They meet on a Friday every third uh, third Friday of the month. Uh, you've got Ostrich, which is the first Saturday of the month. Um, you've got the Doctor Who Club of Victoria. They sort of meet every couple of months uh, at their venue. And you've got uh, Star Walking, uh, which is the Star Wars Club, which ironically is kind of struggling from a social club side in Melbourne. But in Sydney, they're actually doing quite well. They've actually got a really good regular attendance going on up there. So where Melbourne is sort of suffering a little bit, Sydney's picking up the slack. So the four primary ones are still going and have been going for a very, very long time, for decades. So ideally, you'd like to think in 10 years, they'll still be here and still going strong. As to how they'll look is a different question, but uh, at least they're still going. And I guess that's one thing to be thankful for. One of the uh, interesting things that I think is also going to happen is that the Comic-Cons that we know now, which primarily just um, avenues for people to get a, an autograph and all that, I think that's actually going to change. I think we're going to see less uh, stars coming out with their uh, autographs and more back to a mainstream one because one of the things with uh, COVID was that they couldn't get actors out and they were performing these uh, conventions that were basically for the fans, by the fans, and they were very successful. So I think we're going to get to the point where the big conventions that we see uh, are going to change and we're going to see less people with uh, signatures for sale and, and more fan activity. So how's that for a bit of a prediction? Yeah, it's an interesting one because for the past 10 years, say from about 2010 to even today, you know, COVID issues notwithstanding, there were three big uh, if you want inverted commas, Comic-Con type expos, uh, particularly in Melbourne, you had Supernova, you had Armageddon, which turned into AMC, and you had uh, Oz Comic-Con. And the thing was, they were bringing out so many guests at a time that I said this even back in 2012, 2013, I said, they're actually going to oversaturate the market to the point where they're just going to run out of people to bring out. And that's actually happening now. And there's a massive instance occurring at the moment where an event will say, we've got these guests attending. And I'll have friends of mine who'll say, well, I really don't want to see those people. I'm not really interested in those people. And the ones I do want to see, I've already seen. So there's more supply than there is demand, I guess. And back in the days, and you'll know this quite well, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, whenever an actor came out to Australia, it was like the greatest thing in the entire universe. Now people are just like, you know, being very, being very picky about it. Go, oh, no, I've seen this person before, got their autograph, got their photograph, I really don't care. So that is definitely a possibility that um, the whole celebrity side may sort of struggle as time goes on because there's not enough quality shows and movies being produced to warrant bringing these people out. So it's an interesting sort of prediction and I tend to agree with you. I think that uh, 10 years from now, the guest side of these events may struggle. They may bring these people out, but whether there's a demand for them, that's another thing. But the actual events themselves will continue on because they're large you know, profit-making events. One of the things that will stay, uh, I think, pretty solid is cosplay. I mean, there is always a, a great number of costumes that turn up to these events, and I don't see that uh, that will ever die off. In fact, it may actually improve because... The way social media is these days, people love being um, able to show themselves off. So I think sort of, uh, if anything, cosplay over the next 10 years will get even more massive than what it is now. Yeah, whenever these events are being promoted, they're always pushing the costuming side at the forefront. You know, massive cosplay competition and uh, cosplay, professional cosplayers coming out and all sort of business. That is a huge draw card now. The interesting side will be, and I have seen this with some of the large costuming groups, where they burn people out because there are so many events and there's this mindset of saying, I've got to produce new outfits like every time there's a show on, that three or four years down the track, people say, you know, I'm kind of over it now. I've just, I've done so much and it's unrelenting. It just keeps going and going and going. So I wouldn't be surprised if the amount of costumers increases, like you said, but the individuals themselves are sort of getting refreshed on a regular basis. So the people you see doing costuming five years from now 
um, aren't doing it at the moment and the people who are doing it today won't be doing it in the future. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that actually occurs just based on evidence of, that I've seen already. But yes, costuming is one thing that is not going anywhere uh, at any point soon. Actually, one of the things I see maybe potentially declining is dealers and collectibles because I don't think the younger kids are collecting as much as what uh, us older guys do. I mean, a lot of these um, expensive figures and, and, and collectibles are being driven probably by the over 50 market. So I also anticipate that uh, the interest in um, uh, collecting high-end figures and all that will eventually drop off. Yeah, that's a good one because uh, I spend time in uh, Aaron Challenger's store. He runs a store called Aaron's Collectibles. I was actually there on Saturday and it is a pop culture collectible shop. And there is definitely a, a mindset to say that the people who are buying collectibles are of the older generation. Sure, there's an exception to the rule. There's always exceptions to the rule. But I think if you're right, if you were to say, show me 100 hardcore collectors, whether they be Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, whatever, the bulk of them are older adults and not so many younger people. So that's an interesting one. So if you have a younger person who's in their early 20s, as a, an example, will they say, yep, collecting is now my thing. I'm walking into stores, I'm buying all the stuff and I'm really getting into it. Now, of course, when we got into it, we were influenced by all of our peers who were roughly the same age and we sort of went on this massive journey together. So I'm intrigued to see where that one goes, but uh, I think you're definitely onto something there. And the other thing I predict is that I think that the Star Wars prequels movies will actually eventually have more fans than the classic in about 10 years' time. We're starting to see a lot of it now where there's that sort of love for uh, uh, Anakin Skywalker, uh, dare I say it, sort of Jar Jar Binks even, uh, Darth Maul. Uh, and I see in 10 years' time where that audience that was watching the movies in 1999, 2005 and all that will be the bulk of Star Wars fans and they'll be the ones that uh, will have more... Uh, hope on the prequels than the original. See, it is so funny that you should say that because, as I said, I was in Aaron's store on Saturday. A guy came in wearing a T-shirt that was from the prequel trilogy. And he said, and it's just funny, this is only, like, what, two days ago, and he said the prequels were his films and he loved The Phantom Menace. And it was interesting because he even said, look, I really like Jar Jar Binks and all that sort of thing. So um, I agree with you, and it's uh, because... People who were like children when the prequels came out really dialed into those movies, the older fans not so much. But, of course, those children have now grown up into adults themselves. Now, it's it, it's kind of hard to get your head around, but it makes a great deal of sense. And as I've said before, the classic series, when they first came out, were 10-year-old kids of that generation, which was me and you and, and a few other of our, few of our friends. The prequel trilogy was the 10-year-olds of that generation in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, of course, you've got the sequel trilogy for 10-year-olds <laughs> Uh, kids who were 10 years old, I know, five or six years ago. And it's kind of funny because, like, using Phantom Menace as, as an example, when it came out in 1999, I mean, it was a huge hit financially. A lot of people were critical of it. Ten years later, in 2009, at our Star Wars fan club meeting, we said, let's celebrate Phantom Menace turning 10 years old. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted a bar of it. Everybody just ignored it. Go to 2019, even at Celebration in America, they had a 20th anniversary of Phantom Menace, and it was a huge success. And it's just funny how something that was utterly despised 20-something years ago has now come into being in the forefront of people's minds. So I think you're on to a, a good point. But whether you can compare the success of the prequel trilogy with the original ones, it's hard to judge because of now with um, the internet and social media and whatever else, we can actually see the popularity of it there. So I think it's sort of on a knife's edge. The question will be whether in 20 years' time, so in 2043, uh, whether the sequel trilogy will have a massive um, generation of new fans. And I would be intrigued to see what happens with that. But I, I agree with you. I do believe the prequels are sort of like getting a resurgence of new life. And conversely, um, with Star Trek fandom, I think it's had a good run at the moment. But in 10 years' time, I don't know if it's actually going to exist anymore because a lot of the Star Trek fans are the older people and you don't hear about too many new Star Trek fans of a younger era. So we may actually finally sort of see uh, Star Trek being uh, written off as a, um, a fan item. 
Yeah, Star Trek fandom is definitely finding its place online um, through all the various Facebook groups and social media groups in terms of actual people turning up to things. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, at the moment, it's like in Melbourne, we have Austrek, and that's been going now since 1976. And I can say from first-hand experience, it is definitely older people going to Austrek Star Trek events at the moment. So I think if there are new fans who come into Star Trek, they will probably just want to exist online. And I think Doctor Who is exactly in this boat. I mean, Doctor Who is going through a massive resurgence at the moment, has been for the since, what, mid-2000s. And I wouldn't be surprised if the bulk of all those younger fans just exist on the internet only, just the you know, the Facebook pages and the Instagrams and whatever else. So they may, as in Star Trek and Doctor Who, may be going side by side in terms of saying, well, our franchises are huge, generating new content and doing really, really well on screen, but they're struggling to get people out of the houses and into the events. So, yeah, there is going to be some big changes uh, occurring in a decade from now. So 20, it's hard to imagine, this is 2033, some things will change, some things won't change, but we might look upon this episode 10 years from now and go, how close were we to the truth? But at the moment, there is definitely some areas that are struggling. There's no denying that. So who knows? We may be uh, seeing AI turn up and managing conventions. Well, it's been interesting. You'd ask AI, how do I make my fan clubs work better and attract more people? I mean, the actual events exist. They're there. They are there. It's getting people to them and keeping them there. That's the hard part. Now, once upon a time, it wasn't such a big deal because, okay, you'd lose some people, but you'd just replace them with other people and the cycle would continue. But now when you lose them, you're not replacing them. Let's book ourselves in for 2033 so we can do a show and just see how right we were. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one. So that'll be Nerdy Things from Another World, uh, Season 10. How good is that? With that in mind, Mr. Jeffro, hopefully we've answered that question from that really, really dodgy Michael J. dude. So who actually was that Michael J. dude, by the way? That was Michael J. Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> Cheapest creepers. Maybe in 10 years' time you can think of some better names, I'll tell you what. Um, so we need to move on to our main topic of conversation, and this is an interesting one because everybody will have thoughts and opinions about how this should have uh, transpired. But what are we talking about tonight, Mr. Jeffro? Yes, so tonight's topic or today's topic or this morning's topic or this afternoon's topic, depending on when you're listening to this topic, is sci-fi movies which should have had a sequel. So this is a really great topic, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this one. So we've got a lot of movies out there that have had sequels, and typically what happens, and we've seen this multiple times, and we've discussed it multiple times, where the first sequel is really, really good, and after that it all just goes downhill and it kind of tanks. But there are certain movies out there that when you get to the end of them, you go, well, what happens next? What, what's, what's the next bit? And there is no next bit. There's no sequel to them whatsoever. Maybe that was a good thing. As we saw with the Matrix movie, by itself was fantastic. They make the sequels, it turns into rubbish. But we're going to chat about some films that uh, we thought, well, a sequel might not have been a bad idea, providing they didn't do a number three and a four and a five and a six and destroyed the franchise. So I've got a list of things that I've been thinking about in regarding stories that I love, would love to have seen how they continued on. Doesn't mean that they would have been good sequels, but it, you do wonder where it would have gone. So what do you think, Mr. Jeffro? Yeah, there's some great movies and sequels in my research inevitably don't get done because the movie tanked out. So it's all to do with the uh, the financing and particularly so with my beloved Buckaroo Bonsai. So at the end credits, they even put that the next movie was going to be Buckaroo Bonsai against the World Crime League. And of course, famously never happened. But we did actually get to see that uh, solved in a, um, a novel that came out many, many years later, as well as uh, some of the comic books. So we did sort of get the sequel, just not in celluloid form. There will be people out there who will say, oh, they didn't make a sequel in film form, but they did it in a comic form or a novel form. We're not including that. We're saying that oh, we want to see sequels as other films because, yeah, some franchises, you're right, never got made into movies and they just sort of continued them on in literature form. So we're not including those. So we're just putting that disclaimer up front so people don't yell at us and go, oi, hang on, there's all these books that came out afterwards. That doesn't count, okay? We're just talking about strictly about movies. So for myself, there's a whole lot that I sort of thought about, and I go, wow, well, they got to the end of the movie. It was great. It was wonderful, but it's the old cliche. What happens next? And I'm going to probably rattle a few of them off before we end the conversation, so I'm going to kick this one off. So with District 9, um, Vickers, of course, turns into a prawn. 
So you want to know what happens to him and his future. And, of course, do the aliens return after Christopher Johnson escapes? So if you remember, he gets the spaceship, he goes back up to the mothership, the mothership flies away. Well, what happens next? Does he come back? Does he not come back? Do they come back and destroy the Earth? That is one that you go, a sequel to that would have been really interesting. It could have been another Independence Day. You just don't know. But you got all the prawns stuck in South Africa. Does he just leave them there? Or does he come back for them? So what do you think? Do you um, reckon there could have been a sequel in that one? I, I believe there could have been. And when I was looking online, there was a lot of uh, people that thought that that would be very much worthy of a, uh, a sequel. But I think just like, uh, as I said before, maybe the uh, the, the money wasn't there. So... Uh, they couldn't actually go ahead and do anything. Oh, anyway, it doesn't bother me that it doesn't exist, but it's one of those things you go, well, from a narrative point of view, at least there's something there to work with. There are some movies when they finish, you go, well, that's the end of the story. There's nothing more to discuss. Uh, the movie Passengers is a perfect example. You get to the end of the movie, you know, the, they've arrived at their planet, The our heroes have died off. There's no other story to tell. So that's done, finish, move on. But there are other ones you go, well, okay, what would happen next? And so just as another example, as I said, I'm going to rattle a few of these off. The original day the Earth stood still, right? Klaatu's come to Earth, told everybody about your nuclear weapons program, knock it off. He flies away. Suddenly the Earth has discovered, hey, there's extraterrestrial life there now and we're being watched. What do they do, right? What's the deal with that? Does the whole Earth get together and suddenly they're one big happy family or do they just intensify their, their conflicts with one another? To, so... I don't know. I don't know if it would have been a good story, but you do wonder at the end. It's like, well, what did everybody say to them? They all turn to each other and go, oh my God, there's aliens here now. What do we do? You know, do we now stop nuclear proliferation or we just increase it? So it might not have been a good sequel, but I'm intrigued to know what happened. And the ones that really annoy me is the ones that have great source material where there's uh, either books or comics that could be mined, but due to um, the studio's not wanting to take a risk these things don't get made so uh one movie that we've both uh, enjoyed is john carter the disney movie mm. now they had 11 books in that series in fact the um the director had said that he was going to look at doing gods of mars and warlords of mars as the second and third movie but of course famously it tanked at the box office and we never got to see that uh, the other one is the judge dread movies so uh, we had Carl Urban actually proactively campaigning to see another movie. And it was initially announced in 2022 that they were going to do Judge Dredd Mega City 1. And that gave us a lot of optimism. But I think sometimes the talk's there, but these things just never happen because uh, for one reason or another, things like uh, Carl Urban get a job on television in The Boys, so he'll be probably doing that for a good number of years. And by that time, sort of when he, when he gets out of doing that show, I guess the interest will be lost. It's interesting because you do get movies that have sequels that are made decades after the original. Uh, and there are the two primary ones, of course, are Blade Runner 2049 and Tron Legacy. And in both instances, it worked rather well because it continued the story. So they can... I know, pull these things out of the ether from time to time. Um, here's a couple more that I'm just going to toss in from a uh, you know, rack your brain around this one. In Metropolis, the 1927 version, uh, Freda unites the two classes, right? The working class and the, I don't know what you call it, the upper class. Does it actually work? Does it actually unite them or do they just go back to their own where they used to be and like they, they, they still need the workers to run the machines that operate the city and the rich people are still rich? So you do wonder if that actually kind of, went anywhere after that you know so uh i don't know i'm just putting it out there no big deal and this one was kind of covered off in a tv series uh the movie westworld from the 70s i mean so the delos theme park right all the humans get killed off by the robots so what happened after that right did the whole corporation break down was there like massive lawsuits did they brush it under the carpet now it's covered off in the tv series a little bit but from the film perspective imagine a sequel of that now they did do future world I accept that, uh, but I'm looking at something specifically related to Westworld. I sort of certainly think of the same thing with Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I mean, it ends on a downbeat ending. I'd love to know, is there any sort of resistance that fights back or do the Body Snatchers win? I want to see that sequel, but uh, uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah, it's interesting when you have alien invasion movies where the aliens have just taken over everything and there's only a small pocket of people left. I think there was a Tom Cruise movie, uh, Oblivion, and in the end, they destroy the big uh, alien ship, and that's all fantastic. But humanity, there's only like 50 people left. 
It's like, well, what happens with those guys? <laughs> it's not like suddenly everything's great and they just rebuild the cities and population turn, returns back to normal. That's just not going to happen. So it's kind of a happy ending, but not a happy ending at the same time. Uh, with that in mind, this one is an absolute ripper, right? You get to the end of the movie, THX 1138. Now, if you remember the movie, THX escapes from the city. He climbs up this enormous uh, tunnel. The robots leave it, let him go. The police robots let him go. He stands out in the open. He's in the sunset. And it's like, well, what happens next? What's he looking at? What's the world like? And we don't get to see anything. So you could, like, over the hill, because it's all, like, silhouetted in the, in the sunset, you do one. It's like, well, what's he? What's what's the next thing? What's he going to do? Is he going to starve to death because the whole place is being polluted and contaminated or whatever? Is he going to walk out there and go, oh my god, there's like, like millions of billions of people out here that didn't know that we were under the ground? I'd love to know what happens next, but we unfortunately don't know. And there could be a thousand different interpretations to that one. But I always thought that thought that was a good one. It's like, what happens after he escapes? But we'll never know. Those kind of movies are really great because they let your imagination set up what could actually happen, whereas I think a lot of the movies these days, it's just given to you on a plate. Now, one of the movies I wanted to mention was uh, Little Shop Horrors. In the uh, original alternative ending, the actual alien plant took over the world, and I would love to see if they had uh, gone with that original ending where that would have led to. Well, they did. It was called the Day of the Triffids. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and in fact, Day of the Triffids is a good one because it's like, okay, at the end, they find that I think salt water destroys the plants. It's all great and wonderful, but everybody's still blind. There's no fix for that. So it's like, like, as we discussed, I think, in our last episode, the whole planet is full of blind people. And it's like, well, that just doesn't, there's no like magic button that just uh, returns everything back to normal. So that is one that I think they get to the end of the story and go, you know what, that's in the too hard basket. We'll let someone else figure it out. And, of course, no one does figure it out. So uh, I reckon that the mortality rate of humanity uh, over the coming months would be like 99%. People just will all just die off out of starvation or whatever. So, But, you know, that's a pretty depressing ending. Um, this one was deliberately left ambiguous, right? And I think there are comics on that that cover this off. And there's a lot of speculation. But, of course, it was the 1982 version of The Thing. At the end, there are two guys left, Charles and McCready. Right, the base is burning down. What happens next? Is one of them a thing? Are they both human? They're clearly going to freeze to death, right? And eventually, the rescue teams are going to arrive to pick up the bodies and see what the hell happened. What's the next bit of that story? And is one of them uh, a thing? And there's a lot of theories regarding child. So, I mean, that, is, that there's a whole lot you could really work with in that. They pick up the dead bodies. They take them back to uh, like. Um, civilization childs is actually a thing and off we go there's a massive takeover regarding the alien here so but that was left completely ambiguous so there's no right or wrong answer on that one um but that is the one that as a sequel could have been an absolute ripper if done properly so uh but unfortunately it wasn't to be i i agree with the words if done properly because in my research i was thinking wouldn't it be really good if Escape from New York got a sequel? And then I reminded myself that it actually did, and it was not that good. No, it sucked, Escape from L.A. And then, of course, it was effectively the same story. It was just in a different city. So that was a good example of one that says, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Um, another one that I'm going to just chuck in there, this was another one which had the ending. You go, ah, oh, what's the next bit? Is they live? So, of course, the aliens have, have well, taken over the Earth and... Um, people are in this like mindset which is very similar to today about you know just buying products and you know the commercialization and consumerization of everything but now of course everybody can see the aliens at the end of it it's like well what happens next what's the next bit do they all live together in one big happy family do the aliens go left and the humans go right do they sort of have a war, world war between them i don't know but it's like oh don't leave it hanging there <laughs> but of course they did it could work out like alienation where well, they all get to live in harmony and they get to drink sour milk. Yeah, well, that's right. But the problem is that, you know, the humans are going to go, oh, you've, like, you've been corrupting us for all this entire time. Now, of course, you've got the collaborators as well, the human collaborators, so you don't know how that's going to work. There's a whole lot of theories that you could put together. Now, of course, the thing about these stories is you can come up with really great concepts, but whether you can produce a story that works for an actual movie is anybody's guess. And in some cases you're probably going off on tangents that probably wasn't the original plan. A good example of that, and this is a sequel, of course, as I mentioned earlier, was Blade Runner 2049. 
where they went a completely different tangent. Suddenly it's the humans versus the replicants and you go, where did that all come from? And the replicants are sort of like creating themselves effectively. So I don't think that was part of the original design of the story when they did the first movie, but you know, if that's the direction they're going in, then so be it Jedi. But once again, it's the old us versus them scenario. So I don't know if that would have occurred in They Live, but uh, who knows? Now, there's a few movies that uh, I was looking up that um, would have been nice to have got sequels, but unfortunately uh, didn't happen. Forbidden Planet, I found out there was talk in 1958 they were going to do a sequel called Robot Planet, and I thought, that sounds really good, but uh, it just never happened. Uh, Another one that uh, would have been very good would be Spaceballs. And they actually say in the movie uh, Spaceballs 2, the search for more money. But unfortunately, as uh, Mel Brooks said, that uh, a lot of the cast actually were old, that they died off. And, of course, Rick Moranis retired from acting. So for that reason, they couldn't really do it without him. But that would have been interesting to see if they'd gone ahead and, and followed through on that. Yeah, so I don't think so. I think yeah, if you have a movie that's reasonably successful, does well, you can promise a sequel, just don't deliver it because then the expectation is that it'll surpass the original and if it doesn't, then you go, well, that was kind of stupid, even though the gag was they're they're doing it, uh, the search for more money. Uh, Forbidden Planet, I don't know how you do a sequel to that because um, they're on the ship, okay, like Altera's on on board the C-57D with the crew and they're flying back to Earth, presumably, and she's the only female on board what kind of story can you make out of that? I mean, I'm not being like facetious, but I'm being legitimate. What kind of story can you make out of that? So if you were saying, oh, they're going to do, was it Robot Planet? What would that be? And where would it be? So that would be so far removed from what the Forbidden Planet storyline first was. I don't think it would work. At the very least, you could do a prequel. These days, you could do a prequel to it with the Krell and when they had their Monster the Vid moment. But uh, I don't know how a Robot Planet would actually work and whether it would actually sort of suit the style of the first movie. I almost imagine it to be a bit like Alien where, you know, you've got the planet and it's like sort of there's a group of explorers that suddenly find themselves on the planet and across the other side of the planet there's like a whole bunch of robots. So, you know, there's more than one civilization there. So that was the way I was sort of picturing it. Although at the end of the movie, Altair 4 does blow up, so that would make it a bit difficult. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Actually, I'm just thinking about it just then. If you're going to do a prequel to Forbidden Planet, it would have to be with the Blairathon mission when, they, when the humans first turn up. Um, and that's when they first discover the Krell. This is um, uh, Morbius and all that sort of thing. And let's loose the Eid monster and whatever. That would be an interesting story, but that's a prequel, not a sequel. But that's one we didn't get to see. We only got to hear his point of view. Um, and I reckon there could be something in that if, once again, it was done properly. The downside is a filmmaker would say, well, we don't really want to do it because we know how it ends. Everybody dies except for Morbius and Altera. Um, There's a couple more that I was thinking to think of, but there's one in particular that I want to cover off, and this was a classic one. You go, what is going to happen now? I hate it when they just leave us dangling. And, of course, now I think it's pronounced Ex Machina. That's the one where Ava, who's an android or a robot, uh, ends up mixing with society. Now, if you remember the movie, there's only like three actors in the whole thing. Both of the two male actors were actually both from Star Wars. And she's um, escaped her confines and she's artificial intelligence. She's a robot or a droid or whatever term you want to use. And she's now arrived at a city. Well, what does she do now? Oh, my God. It's like, don't leave us hanging there. Tell us what is the next thing that she does. And uh, I don't know if you remember seeing that movie at all, but did you ever think the same thing? I I did sort of see that movie, and and the first thing I thought of was Westworld Series 3, where virtually they did that same premise where the robot goes into society. Quite true. I think the difference, though, and this is about the only difference, is that in Westworld there are a whole bunch of them, whereas in Ex Machina, it's just her by herself. But, yes, it's the same principle. And you do wonder, does she just wander around the entire city for the rest of her life? Unless the rest of her life, she's an android. You know, does she sort of, her batteries go flat and she just stops down the middle of the street or uh, does someone try to attack her and she fights them off or whatever? I'd love to just know what happens. So, but uh, alas, we don't know. But you can use Westworld, the TV series, as a bit of a guide, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, it's very, very good. Well, I suspect she'll live for a long time. All she needs is a Tesla EV plug-in and away she goes. <laughs> So wouldn't that be funny? It's like, oh, do you need to plug your car into this charge? No, I need to plug myself into it. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Any further ones that you want to cover off, old son? Uh, One of the ones that uh, would have really been good but uh, never happened was Total Recall. And uh, that was a huge movie in 1990. And I was reading further about that. And the reason why they didn't make 
a sequel because at the time sequels are not something that was done it was sort of looked at as being a bit lowbrow to do something like that i mean that's a whole different ball game these days but of course ironically enough we had uh terminator 2 come out a few years later and show that that is something that would really work but at the time they weren't even looking at uh, doing sequels because that was um, just not on and getting arnie to do it again would have been pretty tough yeah, well, as it is, uh, you're right, right, even though they say, oh, hang on, Judgment Day's come out. Oh, maybe a sequel isn't such a bad idea after all, but they still didn't make one. But what would you do? I mean, it finished on a happy ending. You'd have to create a brand new antagonist. So, you know, Mars has all been sorted out and they've got the environmental things going on. It's all great, wonderful. The bad guys are all being killed off. You'd have to invent an entire brand new story just to make it work. And I don't think you could without ruining the premise of the original movie. So... Um, I think what they did, you know, and when they did the remake was definitely the way to go. But, uh, yeah, it's all well and good to say, let's make a total recall sequel because now sequels are suddenly in vogue. And I tell you what, the writer's room um, and the development in hell, they'll be sitting there scratching their heads going, so what's the deal? What do we do? <laughs> what do, we do? It was a happy ending for everybody. So I don't know, dude. Unless they discover the aliens that were that created the machines suddenly reappear from wherever and um, do something with that. But I reckon that would have been pretty uh, pretty cheesy. What do you think? I just thought uh, to myself, try saying recall sequel three times very fast. That's awfully <laughs> difficult. Ah, absolutely, totally agree with you. But there, the, the point is that there are some movies out there that maybe could have done with a sequel, um, preferably a good one, which is easy to say when you're sitting back here. But there are movies that have had sequels, whether they've come out straight away or decades later that have been successful. It's hard for a lot of shows to say, well, let's just not keep pumping sequels out until the entire franchise is destroyed. Let's keep the quality good. And there are some really, really good franchises out there where all the movies have been massively successful and good on them too. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure people out there will have their own thoughts and views as to some movies. They go, you know what, a sequel to this would have been great. But don't forget, it's not just about the concept. It's about making an actual story out of it and making it work. And that's not easy. That's why a lot of these sequels are so difficult to produce in the first place. So so what do you reckon, Jeffro? I mean, I think we've nailed some really good ones. Although in my research, I was thinking, I'd really love to see a sequel to The Mitchells versus The Machines. And when I was looking at it, it's like, hang on, they've actually done one. So I've got to actually uh, now go on Netflix and uh, check that out. But that was one I thought deserves a sequel, and it actually has been done. Excellent work. Well, I'll tell you one series that won't get a sequel, and that's us, because that's the <laughs> end of our particular season. Season one has come to a close 11 episodes of fantastic nerdy goodness that will rot even the most hardiest of nerdy brains. So uh, just got to say a big thank you for all those people who have been listening. We actually have received some positive feedback about our shows. Um, all they've pretty much said is that uh, we should just get off. <laughs> and leave it at that. So I've taken that as a positive compliment. So there you go. But we're about to wrap up. Um, and uh, once again, we're just going to say a thanks to good old Sci-Fi Zone for hosting us. Don't forget to check us out both on YouTube or the Spotify version. Jeff Rowe, what are your final words for this particular season, old son? I'm thinking just go back and listen to us again. Put us on repeat. Put us on loop. We won't mind. Put the numbers up that way. It's all been good fun. Anyway, we're going to party hard and rock on as per usual. So make sure everybody out there, you <gasps> stay nerdy. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. That's all, folks. <laughs>